good afternoon one and all watching this program csr nadi welcomes you all for the webinar series on advanced water and wastewater treatment so for this made the objective of this program is to uh, educate all the post graduate mtech uh, that means mtech msc and uh, phd scholars working in india for this program uh, through the lectures of well known eminent uh, professors from uh, from about so we started this program last week uh, uh, sending all the flyers and uh, last friday we launched the participation program we given the uh, live that means uh, google forms within these three days we received more than 3500 registration that is uh, it is from india and from abroad it is from oman saudi arabia iraq all these places so this gives a tremendous pleasure to us for uh, launching this program to all so uh, uh, for this program we invited this experts only working and well known experts they have uh, even achieved as more than 100 most of them have more than uh, 100 and most of them are uh, editor in chief of various uh, journals so we kept expert, uh, expert talk for a maximum of uh, 45 minutes to 1 hour followed by a panel experts panel experts will be similar uh, working in the same field of that topic then students and uh, the aspirants seeing this program they can watch this program in fb live they can put their uh, questions or queries in uh, fb live so that after that we will collect all the questions and we will send to the respective speaker for getting the uh, answers then we will post it in our fb account so before start introducing professor david white i uh, in uh, i invite dr rajesh kumar director csr nidhi for his inaugural address sir please thank you uh, dr nidhi uh, professor david white uh, and who is going to be the lead speaker uh, our panel members uh, professor majumdar dr mateshwaran and my colleague dr nidhi uh and all the colleagues and experts and students who have joined uh welcome to this uh, webinar series that we are organizing uh those of you who do not know our institute little bit uh, i thought i'll share it here it started way back in 1958 uh when there was a cholera uh, on a jondis outbreak which happened in this country and that time uh, it was uh, when the institute was started it was called central public health engineering research institute cfa So as we as we progressed, uh, so-called progress, we added a lot of other issues: air pollution, water from industries, uh, from industries again, uh, hazardous waste, and you know related things. So in 1974, uh, Sea Ferry got renamed as NIRI, National Environmental Engineering Research Institute. Our water and wastewater has remained the major main focus and major focus all throughout, even when the naming and renaming was being done. as we go ahead uh, so it seems that we have had a series of technology in wastewater treatment and water treatment has come up uh, the challenges still remain uh, very very much in the respective countries depending upon where we live uh, is, the two challenges which become very very evident and very powerful is that the cost of uh, treatment and if if we, if we are able to address that part of it we are going to benefit large sector of population which cannot afford expensive treatment which is available in many other places and is technically is possible but it's, it's not feasible in many places just to give an example if i take a uh, country like india uh, we do have uh, say point of use uh, tree water treatment systems which is using the ro or membrane or some disinfecting uh, system like ozonation uh, ultraviolet all of those technologies are being used but still it is addressing only about 1 1.5% of the population's need of water in what water so there there is a whole lot of scope of uh, technology and people who understand this this uh, whole domain and uh, they can bring in that uh, knowledge and make sure that this is uh, this is available to everyone uh, in different parts of the world second one which i thought i'll highlight uh, as we go ahead with the webinar series where we have uh, almost 10 11 speakers uh, coming from different countries who are going to speak on various topics of uh, advanced water and wastewater treatment 
is 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 combination of things so many times uh, water treatment uh, group of people in many municipal corporation or urban local bodies are different than wastewater people not knowing very well that wastewater finally ends into water courses and that is what creates problem for all of us so this whole cycle which was earlier probably separate has now become one so if i want to solve a problem of wastewater or want to solve a problem of water i need to understand water and wastewater uh, just game together and that's where the, the the organizing this kind of event when we get people from different cities in the same domain or uh, they can bring their heads together and all those people who are listening to this webinar and discussing it all the panelists who are going to be there and discussing it uh, i'm sure a good outcome will, will be there for all of us to follow and also see uh, that how it can be useful to the larger part of society i'm very glad that uh, our colleagues have organized this and uh, i'm very happy and welcome to professor david bright who has agreed to be there um, this time schedule and biological clock may change a little bit because of our timings uh, but welcome uh, professor david and uh, we look forward to your presentation and discussion uh, thank you very much for having me here and look forward to good intense discussion thank you sir thank you for this uh, inaugural address so uh, before uh, going to uh, david bait's uh, talk i will just introduce a few points about david 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 because it is quite difficult to uh, explain a 45 50 page cv of david bait in 5 uh, minutes anyway i will give a, even uh, his citations you can see around 25000 more than 25000 and h index is around 86 so it is quite difficult to explain a man like david bait in 5 uh, minutes i will shortly i will give only some points about david bait to introduce uh, Uh, the speaker to you professor david white is a scientific professor in school of civil and environmental engineering at university of new south wales sydney australia he served as director of unsw center for water and waste technology now unsw water research center from 1993 to 2006 and was research director of for the school from 1997 to 2006 before taking over as head of the school of civil engineering and environmental engineering in 2007 professor david white obtained his graduate degree from university of tasmania in 1974 masters degree from monash university in 1977 and phd from mit 1984 before joining unsw as head of department of water engineering uh, water engineering in 1993 he spent 8 years undertaking research at australian nuclear science and technology organization ansto and prior to this two years as a postdoctoral doctoral fellow at university of melbourne and five years at state rivers and water supply commission in melbourne his specialty areas of teaching are water chemistry and water treatment and his principal research area is that of investigation of physico chemical processes in natural and engineered system professor david white holds the position of executive chairman of unsw Cha center for transformer environmental technologies in zing and is an associate editor of journal of environmental science and technology acs publications he is he was honored with membership of the uns us national academy of engineering in 2018 so that is a prestigious uh, award for him and we if you are going for uh, going through this uh, his uh, cv you can see a lot of corners so i am i didn't uh, mention all these things because it is quite difficult to uh, mention all these things it will take minimum of one hour anyway <laughs> i we are well <laughs> i am welcoming dr david wade for this uh, uh, inspirational talk because uh, the knowledge, uh, talk from a knowledge person is always welcome professor david wade please start your program Great, great. Thank you, Nadeesh. So let me share my screen with you first, and we'll start right. the talk. Right. Thank you. Okay. Let's see. Okay. There we go. Bon, Nadeesh. Thank you. Thank you very much for the uh, for the welcome and uh, for that long uh, long description of my background. <laughs> um, I have been involved in the water uh, research area for, for many years. 
uh, and I still find it very exciting. There's still many, many things to do. So um, I would like to keep working in this area for another, I don't know, maybe another 20 years, but uh, we'll see, we'll see. Okay, so uh, I'm based in Sydney at the University of New South Wales. It's one of uh, Australia's uh, larger universities. Uh, it has a very strong technology focus, uh, a bit like uh, MIT, uh, where I did my PhD or Imperial College in, in London. Um, and I'll show you some, some nice pictures there of Sydney. For those who've been to Sydney, uh, you'll recognize the, uh, the Opera House, um, uh, beaches like uh, Bondi Beach shown, shown there as well. Uh, we're not going there now because of the, the, the virus, I'm afraid. <laughs> uh, so uh, those sort of places right now are closed for the most part, uh, but it's a, it's a beautiful city. So if you get a chance to come to Australia, come to Sydney and uh, come see our wonderful uh, beaches and buildings. Okay, um, I'm going to give a talk today on a topic that actually I'm fairly, fairly new, uh, new at. Um, uh, the topic of uh, ozonation has been around now for many, many years. Obviously, we use ozonation in water treatment for disinfection purposes. Uh, and that's been, uh, been very popular, especially in Europe. Uh, I think in France, they use ozone uh, very much for, for disinfection purposes. But in the last, um, I don't know, 20 years, maybe 15 years, there's been increasing use of ozonation also in wastewater treatment. Um, and um, that's a topic I'm going to talk about today. Uh, it's for us only been the last three years that we've been working in this area. Um, I've done more work in other areas uh, of advanced oxidation processes related to Fenton chemistry, uh, photochemistry. Uh, so our, our uh, endeavors in this, this field are, are quite new. Um, I know that some of that my colleagues uh, are listening today are much more experienced in this area than I am. But what I want to do to, in today's talk is really give you a picture for how we approach our studies um, and really uh, walk you through the approach we take in my research group uh, with regard to understanding uh, knowledge in areas like, uh, like ozonation. So uh, the title of the talk is Kinetic Modeling Assisted Optimization of the Heterogeneous Catalytic Ozonation Process. And I'm gonna focus mostly on copper catalysts in this talk. Okay. Now let's see. I need to move my our pictures. I can't see myself very clearly. So let's do that. Put them down the bottom. There we go. Okay. So as, as some of you will be aware, there's been use of solid catalysts uh, uh, in the last uh, 20 years as a means of improving the performance of, of ozone. Ozone is quite a strong oxidant, uh, but it's not as strong as it could be, and we can use catalysts to increase the oxidizing ability and potentially to convert ozone into more active forms. Uh, hydroxyl radicals, uh, surface absorbed species, uh, and so on. Now, this technology uh, of heterogeneous catalytic ozonation has been widely used in some parts of the world, not much in Australia, not much, not much in the United States, but in China and India, uh, it's being used now quite widely. Uh, uh, in China, there must be thousands of companies now using uh, catalytic ozonation to treat wastewaters. So it's quite widely used. Um, and I, I, in fact, I have a, a research center in, uh, in China. So I've got a team there of 20, uh, 20 odd people. So I'm quite exposed to uh, China and uh, the practice in China. And we find many companies now using this technology of uh, catalytic ozonation. So it's quite widely used at full scale. Um, and, and there are many recipes for, for catalysts. Uh, uh, it's amazing wandering around uh, China, you, you find uh, every, every uh, research group has their own, their own special recipe for a catalyst. Uh, and, uh, and many companies uh, claim that their catalyst is better than the others. Uh, and so on. There's, there's a huge number of researchers who produce new catalysts 
and claim that their catalyst is the best, the best topic. Uh, now, the reasons why one catalyst is better than another um, or, or how that catalyst works to influence the uh, performance of the, the process, uh, there are many theories in this regard, many different, di many different ideas about how these catalysts work. And so we decided to step into this area and have a look at the, uh, have a look at the area and try to unravel some of the complexities about catalytic ozonation. And so uh, the talk today is our attempt to uh, start to unravel uh, some of the, uh, the, um, uh, the unknowns about this, uh, this uh, interesting and widely used area. Now I show here some of the papers, uh, recent papers by a number of groups uh, who are well known in this area. Uh, um, uh, Chu Wei's group uh, in China, his group, a huge group, have done a huge amount of work uh, on this topic in the last few years. Uh, and they've taken a range of different materials, uh, uh, iron, aluminium, silicon-based materials. And, and they've shown that different materials or, uh, uh, have different abilities to catalyze the process. And they've then proposed different mechanisms. So in the case of, uh, of iron, they propose that uh, this generation of uh, hydroxyl radicals by uh, some sort of surface fenton process that aids the ozonation technology. In the case of, uh, of um, uh, aluminium, uh, they claim that there's a uh, generation of, uh, uh, of oxygen groups, atomic oxygen groups on the surface of the aluminium, and that's why those, those materials work well. Uh, in the case of, of silicon, uh, they're Proposal is that silicon absorbs ozone, O3, and that absorbed form is more active than other forms. So different ideas here about how the, uh, about how the, uh, the catalysts aid the process of ozonation. Uh, another group, uh, uh, Zhongli and Chen's group from Harbin, a group that are very active in, uh, in, uh, in this space, they published recently showing uh, how silicates enhance ozonation. And again, a bit like the, the group from, uh, from Beijing, Chu Jiwei's group, they propose that the, the silicates absorb ozone and that absorbed ozone is much more active than solution-based ozone. Uh, and they, they show that, again, a bit like, uh, like Chu Jiwei's group, that the iron species, whoops, um, go back. Uh, sorry. that the iron species uh, also enhance production of hydroxyl radicals. So there's some consistency in those ideas. Other groups, uh, this group, let me see, again from Harbin, um, they propose that again, uh, ozone uh, adsorbs, there's uh, adsorption of both the ozone uh, and of the, uh, uh, the, the contaminant here at atrazine and those adsorbed species uh, through uh, uh, the role of uh, uh, the uh, Lewis acid sites uh, induce generation of hydroxyl radicals, and that's what then leads to mineralization of the, uh, of the compound. Um, earlier work by, um, give me to move our pictures out, I can't see this properly, move it up, there we go. Uh, early work by, by uh, Jean-Philippe Couet in, in France. Uh, these workers proposed that the organics uh, the nature of the organics is critical. They found that uh, compounds like citrate and oxalate, pyruvate, that, uh, that form chelate complexes on the surface are much more readily degraded than these uh, compounds, acetate, melanate, that don't form, they, they form monodendic, monodendic complexes. They degrade very slowly. So it seems the nature of the, uh, of the, the adsorbed species uh, is also critical. Uh, and it seems that forming a, a biodentate complex leads to much more rapid degradation than the, uh, the, the monodentate, monodentate species. So all in all, a wide range of views and perspectives on how these catalysts work. Um, they might all be right, um, but uh, what we decided to do was to try to step back and, and look at this, um, uh, this interesting uh, technology and try to um, uh, come to grips with some of the, uh, the underlying uh, uh, processes. Okay.
Well, what we did was to start with some very simple target organics. One of the problems with the technologies, people often use quite complicated organics, which break down to intermediates, which then also then uh, need to be oxidized. So the path through degradation in many cases is quite complicated. In my group, we often start with very simple target species. And so these two uh, target compounds of oxalate and formate are very nice because they both uh, degrade uh, for the most part to, to CO2. And so, uh, so oxalate goes to this oxalate radical, which then oxidizes very quickly to CO2. Uh, and, and formate uh, also, it, it breaks down uh, here to, uh, to carbonate or dissolve CO2. So there's a very simple pathway of transformation of these compounds. There are no intermediates for the most part. Uh, we seem to go from organic target compound to CO2. Uh, and that simplifies analysis very nicely. Uh, in addition, these compounds are quite different. Uh, oxalate is quite resistant to homogeneous ozonation. So this process in solution uh, that I show on the right uh, occurs very slowly. The, the rate constant is quite low for the, uh, the homogeneous process. Um, like the, uh, the JP Curie group, uh, found this, uh, this compound forms strong bidentate metal complexes on the surface of catalysts, particularly with, uh, with catalysts containing iron uh, or, or copper. Uh, in comparison, formate is oxidized quite readily uh, by, by ozone. Uh, you see the, uh, the rate constant there, it's 20 uh, per, per mole per second. Um, let's move our pictures again to one side. So a uh, much faster uh, rate of decay of formate uh, by ozone homogeneously. Uh, and um, as I said earlier, it, it, uh, um, it forms uh, monodentate complexes um, with, uh, with, with catalysts. So quite simple compounds, but quite different behavior uh, to, uh, to ozone. Also, uh, we, uh, we, use, we use radio labeled compounds in order to analyze decay. We, uh, we purchase radio labeled uh, formate and oxalate, uh, carbon 14 labeled. Uh, and so we follow the, uh, uh, the transformation of, uh, of the, the radio labeled uh, oxalate or formate to radio labeled CO2. We can, uh, we can uh, 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 evaporate off the CO2, we can uh, uh, convert it to gas phase by dropping the pH. So we can monitor both loss of the uh, of the uh, the target compound, information of the oxidized product very nicely, and uh, I will say that measuring both the degradation of the target species and formation of the oxidized product is very important to really follow uh, these sort of processes. Many studies don't do that. Many studies simply follow the the degradation of the uh, of the target species, and you're never clear whether it's simply adsorption to the, the catalyst or oxidation. Uh, and uh, this has been one of the major stumbling blocks in this technologies in understanding its, its pathway. Is it adsorption? Is it oxidation? Uh, what are the oxidation products and so on? And, and so uh, we need to choose systems which, which are, are very amenable to, to analysis. And that's why we've chosen these systems very carefully because we can, uh, we can follow uh, adsorption, oxidation. We can separate the two very carefully. Very, very important. Okay, uh, and uh, catalysts, as I mentioned, we are uh, dealt with copper catalysts. We've chosen two catalysts for our, our studies. Um, copper oxide, it's uh, been widely used in uh, uh, catalytic ozonation because it's recognized to be effective. Uh, it's, uh, it's a redox active uh, metal, obviously copper, copper one, copper two, you can even form copper three. Um, and, and so copper is redox active and it seems to act very nicely to activate ozone by forming uh, more active oxidants. And uh, uh, the particles that are formed, uh, in fact, it's tenorite is the mineral formed as shown by the XID pattern on the right. Uh, these particles are around, let me see, there's a four micron bar these are about one micron in, in uh, diameter. Uh, the, the copper and the oxygen are spread uh, uniformly as we expect across the, uh, 
the surface of these particles. We've also used, uh, uh, we've also used another catalyst, uh, and these are copper aluminium layered double hydroxides. Now these, uh, these double hydroxides uh, form, form uh, platelets that are much, much smaller than the copper oxide particles. You see here the, the bars, 600 nanometers. So these are, uh, I don't know, these are about 100, 100 nanometers across these platelets, uh, flakes, they're, they're very thin. Um, they form layered structures uh, and have very high surface area. And so compared to the copper oxide, these, uh, these LDHs have much higher surface area uh, than the, the copper oxide. Again, the XRD is shown on the right. It shows the, uh, uh, the uh, material is a, a very well structured material uh, with a very clear, very clear XRD pattern. So the other two uh, catalysts we've chosen and we've studied the, uh, the impact of these catalysts on ozonation of oxalate and formate. So a, a very well-defined study. What do we get? Well, here are some results. Uh, now, these results show the, uh, the effect of those catalysts on oxidation of oxalate. Uh, look at the, uh, the plot on the, on the top left-hand side. Uh, without the, the catalyst, just straight ozonation solution, homogeneous ozonation, uh, there's very little decay of, uh, of oxalate. So as I said earlier, oxalate's not prone to oxidation by ozone in solution, as we see here, it's very slow decay. But in the presence of both the LDH, shown in the blue, and copper oxide, we see much more rapid oxidation. So clearly, uh, the, the catalyst is having quite a big impact here. Now, I, uh, this is loss of... Um, uh, this is loss of oxalate. Now, these plots, in fact, we've, we've, uh, we've uh, measured both the dissolved and absorbed oxalate in these studies. So this is true, true oxidation. Uh, this isn't just adsorption uh, uh, because we're measuring both the dissolved oxalate and we've also uh, leached off uh, the uh, oxalate from the surface. So th this is total oxalate in the system. So we, we're getting very rapid decay in the system. Um, and I show below that the uh, measurement of CO2 is generated in oxidation of, of, of oxalate. So we see here the oxidation product of CO2. Uh, it, it's almost a mirror image of, uh, of the, the loss of oxalate. So that, that's very nice to show both loss of the target species and formation of the, uh, the oxidized uh, product uh, really shows you that indeed we're getting oxidation. There's no anomaly here. The mass balance is perfect. Uh, and so uh, we know we've got a, a well-managed system. Uh, I show across the top there, the effect of uh, uh, different, um, uh, uh, different oxalate concentrations, one micromolar, 10 micromolar and 100 micromolar. Now in, this, in these studies, we had fixed concentration of catalyst, 0.06 grams per liter. Uh, the ozone concentration is fixed at 10 micromolar. The pH is constant, set at 7.3, and we use a, a carbonate buffer. So we, uh, all the solutions have 2 millimolar bicarbonate, and we uh, equilibrate that with uh, 6,000 ppm of, uh, of CO2 uh, in gas phase. So that sets the pH very nicely at 7.3. It's a very natural buffer. Uh, there are, there are, there are, uh, there's no, no phosphate or other materials, it's just carbonate in the system. Uh, I mean, carbonate itself has interesting chemistry with uh, the oxidants, but we'll come to that in a minute. Uh, but we see here that uh, for one micromolar oxalate and 10 micromolar ozone, we degrade nearly all of the, pretty much all of the uh, oxalate uh, within a few minutes. Um, uh, up here, where we've got 10 micromolar, we see about eight micromolar of the uh, of this oxalate oxidized. Uh, so we're getting pretty good uh, conversion there. Here, where we have 100 micromolar oxalate, we see a bit hard to pick here. Uh, whoops, let's go back. We see there's about um, a 0.9, so there's about 10 micromolar oxalate being oxidized here. So 
we see pretty much uh, in terms of ozone, um, uh, ozone usage efficiency, uh, it's quite low here, about about um, about a ten percent. So about one micromole oxidized uh, with ten micromole of ozone. So there's about about 0.1 ozone usage efficiency. Here it's about 0.8, whereas here it's about one uh, one uh, um, about 100 percent. So we use all of our ozone here and uh, oxidize about uh, 10 micromolar oxalate. So there's an increasing ozone usage deficiency uh, as we uh, increase the, uh, the amount of oxalate. Okay. Now, interestingly and importantly, uh, here we study the effect of the uh, I'm going to minimize the people there. That's better. Okay. So here I'm, here I'm studying the effect of the, the catalyst dose. So the y-axis uh, shows the uh, oxalate uh, uh, degradation uh, and I show the effect of, of, uh, of catalyst dosage here. There's almost no effect here of dose of catalyst uh, on consumption of, uh, of, of oxalate. Uh, and so there's there's no um, there's almost no effect of the catalyst, uh, which is nice. Uh, that tells us that the, uh, that, that the that the the consumption of the the uh, the oxygen the ozone um, there's almost no no consumption of the uh, of the uh, uh, of the uh, uh, of the catalyst. Uh, sorry, there's no there's no consumption of the of the oxygen by the catalyst. We get almost the same degradation. It's about 0.9. So we began with, with uh, we began we began with um, uh, sorry. This is Cion. So this is 10 micromolar here. Uh, sorry, it's one here. 10 micromolar here. Uh, so we've seen that there's about uh, a, a, um, uh, sorry, get back. Uh, we, we're seeing about uh, about. Uh, 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 0.9, uh, so that's, uh, we, we're getting uh, um, quite good oxidation here. Uh, sorry, let's get this right here. So, sorry, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's amount oxidized over, 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 uh, uh, over initial. So we're getting almost all of it oxidized, uh, 0.9. Uh, with almost no effect of the, the catalyst dose. So there's almost no effect of the catalyst dose on performance. And that tells us that there's no consumption of the oxidant, either ozone or hydroxyl radical, whatever the oxidant is, by the catalyst, at least in the presence of, of, uh, of oxalate. Uh, so that's important because it's clear that in many cases, in many studies, the catalyst itself uh, consumes, the, uh, uh, consumes, the, the, uh, uh, consumes the oxidant. And it's, it's the case, same case for both copper oxide and the LDH. Neither of those catalysts consume the, the oxidant. Uh, we're getting pretty much consistent oxidation uh, right across the board uh, in, uh, in the case of oxalate. Uh, in terms of uh, role of hydroxyl radicals, now we, we've added uh, in these studies uh, tertiary butyl alcohol. Uh, it's a, a bulk hydroxyl radical scavenger, so uh, TBA scavenges hydroxyl radicals in the bulk. It doesn't really touch anything on the surface. It's a solution phase scavenger. And uh, what we're showing here is that hydroxyl radicals are not active in solution at all. There's almost no effect you can see of adding millimolar TBA. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, this, uh, this is showing the, the CO2 generation. There's almost no effect of adding the hydroxyl radical scavenger. So whatever's going on here to drive oxidation, it's not being driven by hydroxyl radicals in solution. And that's the case both for the LDH and for the copper oxide. And so it's clear that uh, the, the process does not involve hydroxyl radical generation uh, in solution. Uh, it's, it's for the most part a surface process. Uh, oxidation is occurring on the, uh, on the surface uh, or, or, or by ozone in solution, uh, but it's not being driven by, uh, by hydroxyl radical generation in solution. Let's move on and look at the effect on formate 
of these catalysts. Quite a different story. And you see on the top left hand uh, plot, uh, in the absence of the, uh, of the catalyst, uh, the black line here, just conventional homogeneous ozonation, we're getting quite, quite good ozonation uh, just by straight ozonation. As I said earlier, formates quite readily degraded by ozone. We see it here, both for one micromolar uh, ozone, the top plot, and the second plot here, uh, B, we're seeing here, uh, again, quite uh, effective ozonation uh, in, in solution. And indeed, there is some improvement uh, when we add the catalysts. We see that for both the LDH uh, catalysts shown here in blue and for copper oxide in red, there's more rapid uh, uh, oxidation, uh, but it's nowhere near the, uh, the difference we saw for oxalate because the solution phase process is quite effective here. And you see it even more in the case of 10 micromolar here, uh, the copper oxide, in fact, it, it, it degrades rapidly, but then it, it plateaus out um, at about 60% um, degradation. Uh, in the case of uh, the, the, the LDH, uh, it does continue further and, and almost mirrors, in fact, the uh, homogeneous process. Uh, in the case of uh, CO2 generation, again, the mirror image pretty much. Here we see uh, so this is a mirror image of, of this, uh, this, this plot on the left-hand side. We're seeing CO2 generation, copper oxide, plateaus out, just as we saw for the, the loss of formate, plateau, plateauing out here at later times. Um, uh, whereas with the LDH, we are seeing ongoing generation of CO2 as the, uh, uh, as the formates oxidize. Uh, so uh, again, I've really said what I've uh, summarized here, but I've really said it uh, in my comments uh, as I've talked about those, uh, those slides. Now, uh, in terms of the effect of catalyst dose, we saw there was no, almost no effect in the case of the uh, uh, layered double hydroxide. Uh, that's not quite the case uh, um, in, for formate. There's a bit of an effect here uh, for the, the, the uh, L, LDH. But there's quite a large effect of the, of the, the catalyst dose uh, on formate oxidation here. So rather different story here where the, the dosage is clearly having quite a big effect. So increasing the, uh, the, uh, the dose of, uh, of copper oxide is, uh, is pretty dramatic. So it does seem as though in this case, there is some what I call futile consumption of the oxidant, either ozone or hydroxyl radical uh, uh, on the surface. Uh, in the case formate oxidation um, through interaction with, uh, with the copper oxide. Uh, but the, uh, the effect, uh, the, the loss of the oxidant is fairly minor, not completely minor, but, but uh, certainly less than copper oxide in the case of the, uh, the layer double hydroxide. And, and so it does seem that in, in, for both target species that uh, the LDHs give more efficient ozone use compared to copper oxide but there's clearly loss in the oxidant here in the, in the case of copper oxide. Again, uh, like, uh, like, uh, like the, the oxalate, there's almost no role of, of hydroxyl radicals in solution. As you can see here from the TBA, uh, again, for the LDH and the, the copper oxide. So whatever's, whatever's occurring is not occurring in solution uh, 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 and being driven by hydroxyl radicals. So it's uh, either a degradation process given by ozone in, in solution or by ozone on the surface or other oxidants on the surface. Okay. Uh, what about uh, uh, interaction of the uh, of ozone with the, uh, with the catalyst? Well, I've already made some uh, inferences about that, but let's look at this uh, in, uh, in more detail. Uh, now, firstly, in the absence of the catalyst, we see here ozone does decay uh, slowly. There is some self decay. Ozone reacts with itself uh, and go through a homogeneous decay process. Uh, as, I've already, uh, as I've already said, uh, the uh, the decay in the presence of LDH is quite uh, is quite slow, uh, and not much not much different, in fact, 
uh, to the, uh, the self decay that occurs in solution. Whereas the, uh, the, the decay in the presence of copper oxide is quite dramatic. So clearly um, uh, the copper oxide having quite a big impact here in, uh, in decaying ozone. Now it may, be, uh, it may be transforming ozone most likely to, uh, to hydroxyl radicals that can then act as an oxidant on the surface, not in solution as I've shown you, but on the surface. So we're slowly now pulling apart what's going on and gaining a, clear, gaining a clearer picture of, the, of the, the process. One other interesting fact here is that um, polychlorinated, um, uh, sorry, parachlorinated benzoic acid, PCBA, is a good scavenger for ozone. It reacts quickly with ozone, as you can see here, and degrades the ozone. So uh, you can see here that the PCBA, in the absence of the catalyst, uh, degrades ozone quickly. Um, here I show again the ozone plot I've shown here uh, just with the, uh, the LDH. Um, and here I show that even in the presence of uh, PCBA that in solution degrades uh, ozone very quickly, in the, in the presence of the catalyst, that decay by ozone slow down dramatically. And so it's clear that the, uh, the catalyst uh, is, is preventing this, uh, this scavenger in solution from, uh, from degrading the ozone. So it's clear that ozone uh, through adsorption most likely to the catalyst uh, is, uh, is um, it's, it's being stabilized by the catalyst. So the catalyst clearly stabilizing uh, the ozone in some way. Okay. Uh, in terms of catalyst organic interaction, um, it's clear from both earlier studies and from our own work that adsorption is a, a critical step uh, in, uh, in, uh, in catalytic ozonation. Uh, let's look at the interaction of the target species with the catalyst. On the left-hand side, I show the, uh, uh, the effect of the catalyst LDH on ozone adsorption. So these are just straight adsorption studies. Uh, there's no ozone here, and we see uh, we see that as we increase the, the catalyst dose, uh, we increase the uh, uh, the concentration of adsorbed oxalate. Uh, I show uh, the bottom plot here on the left shows the adsorption formate. It's not as strongly absorbing as oxalate, uh, mainly because it, it only forms that monodentate uh, uh, surface species, whereas the oxalate forms a bidentate. It's a much more strongly binding entity. Uh, but there is some adsorption as we increase the, uh, the catalyst dose, there is increasing adsorption. Uh, in comparison, copper oxide is quite a weak adsorbent. It does adsorb oxalate to some extent, as shown here. Um, formate, uh, even less so here. Uh, this is 0.06 gram per liter of, uh, of copper oxide. At that dosage, there's almost no adsorption of formate. Uh, we need to go up 10 times to 0.6 grams per liter to see some absorption of, of formate. So quite a low affinity of, uh, of uh, a formate and oxalate for the, the copper oxide, which isn't surprising. It's got quite a low surface area uh, compared to the LDH. And uh, it, it's, uh, it also hasn't got that layered structure uh, to, uh, to absorb the, uh, the, the target species. So what have I said? Let me just conclude, uh, uh, summarize the major point. So uh, rapid absorption of ozone on the surface of the of copper aluminum LDHs occurs uh, with the surface ozone decaying at quite a slow rate, at quite a similar rate to what we see in solution. So the absorption process uh, doesn't have much effect on ozone decay. So it doesn't seem to, this catalyst doesn't seem to uh, induce transformation of the ozone to another oxidant. In comparison, copper oxide, it does absorb ozone quickly, but consumes ozone as well, uh, and forms presumably a, a, a surface oxidant. Uh, it could well be hydroxyl radicals, uh, which, is consumed, which is consumed uh, both by adsorbed organics, but also by the catalyst. Uh, hydroxyl radicals are extremely reactive and will tend to decay uh, and react with anything, uh, with the catalyst surface, or with adsorbed organics if they're there. Um, 
And uh, it, it also seems that some of the absorbed organic, uh, some of the absorbed ozone reacts with the surface sites uh, to form non-reactive products. So there's some, a futile consumption of ozone uh, to form non-reactive products. Uh, I've shown you the rapid binding of both oxalate and formate occur, but the extent of binding to a formate uh, is less than, uh, than, than that of, uh, uh, of oxalate and binding to, to copper oxides much less than binding to, to LDH. Uh, also, I've, sh I've shown you that oxidation of oxalate occurs on the surface of the, uh, the copper aluminum LDH uh, and, uh, and copper oxide. Um, uh, with a copper oxalate surface complex uh, being readily oxidized by, by superficial ozone in the case of the LDH and by uh, superficial ozone and, and probably hydroxyl radicals in the case of copper oxide. Uh, the, the formate uh, oxidizes in the presence of the copper LDH and copper oxide, also by interaction of the uh, surface complexes with uh, uh, surface oxidants, uh, both ozone and, and hydroxyl radicals. Uh, and uh, due to the slow formation and or lower reactivity of uh, surface located formate compared to surface located oxalate, uh, the, uh, the efficiency of ozone usage is, uh, is much lower in the presence of formate than it is in the presence of oxalate. Okay, so those are major observations. So what, what my group try and do is initially put together uh, a basic uh, empiric uh, empirical observations from uh, experiment and then ask, can we develop a mechanistic understanding of this? And can we actually use our, our mechanism and describe this quantitatively uh, with a model based on that mechanism? And so uh, there's a lot known about ozone, uh, this ozone chemistry uh, by uh, colleagues who are listening tonight, by a, a lot of Chinese colleagues and others. So we know a lot about ozone reaction. Uh, in solution, there's a huge amount of information. And uh, we know uh, a lot about ozone self-decay, and I, I list here the, the reactions that are well recognized by, by many workers over the years. Uh, Urs von Gunten at Airbag has published extensively um, on reactions of ozone with hydroxyl radicals, ozone with, uh, with peroxide, uh, with superoxide, and so on. So these self-decay reactions are well known. Um, uh, Bielski, uh, Torbe, uh, and others, have published, and these rate constants are well known in the literature. Uh, so there's a lot of information about the, the reactions and the rate constants. Um, also scavenging reactions. Uh, we know that um, um, hydroxyl radicals are generated here, a reaction of ozone, with superoxide produces a hydroxyl radical. Uh, it's scavenged uh, by uh, peroxide, by, by carbonate, uh, and so on. Uh, these carbonate radicals that are formed also scavenge. So we, we know a lot about these reactions as well in solution. So again, rate constants by, you know, old studies, Bielski, Buxton, uh, my own group uh, back in mid-2000s, uh, mid uh, a lot of work on, on these reactions. So these rate constants are well known. We also know a lot about the oxidation of these target compounds of formate and oxalate uh, by uh, conventional ozonation. And uh, these reactions are well, well understood. Uh, the rate constants here are well tabulated. Uh, workers like, again, Buxton, uh, Hoenye, uh, uh, and others, uh, these are all well-known reactions. So we can write down these reactions. Uh, it looks complicated, but it's not that, uh, that complex because these are well-known reactions. We know the rate constants. What about the, the surface species, the surface reactions? Well, these are a bit less known. Uh, what sort of reactions do we have? Well, we, we have uh, ozone adsorption. Now, I show the surface here by these three, uh, three, three, three lines. So this shows simply ad ozone adsorption to the surface of the catalyst to form some sort of absorbed ozone. Uh, and I show here the desorption reaction, desorption of ozone back to solution, uh, so the back reaction. Uh, and uh, so we have here the adsorption rate constant uh, and uh, the, uh, the, the desorption rate constant. Now, these are not so well known. These rate constants are not well known. These have all been obtained in our study here uh, that I've just shown you. So, so these rate constants we've, we've derived uh, through these lab studies. Um, 
other reactions. Ozone on the surface can then transform to, uh, to hydroxyl radicals. Whoops, let me go back. So we can go from ozone adsorbed to uh, adsorbed hydroxyl radicals uh, on the surface. We can also transform ozone on the surface to these non-reactive products, this futile reaction that doesn't get us anywhere. Uh, also, in a much faster reaction, you can see from the rate constants here, the hydroxyl radicals, as they react with anything, to, uh, to give non-reactive products. Uh, we, we can also describe uh, the adsorption, and I've shown you the, uh, the data from the lab. We can then model that and uh, 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 look at the adsorption of uh, formate and oxalate to the surface. Uh, these are the, uh, the uh, formation constants for the solution uh, surface complexes with both the LDH and copper oxide. Um, and look at the, the, look at the uh, formation constants, uh, much higher in the case of oxalate than formate. Uh, the, uh, the formate adsorbs much less readily to the surface than does the oxalate. So we're building up here our, a set of equations for these surface reactions. And in terms of oxidation, uh, let's see, we have uh, oxidation of formate by surface ozone to give CO2 uh, and uh, rate constant shown here is 40 per mole per second. Um, the next reaction shows oxidation of adsorbed formate by adsorbed hydroxyl radicals. Um, diffusion control, it happens so quickly, 10 to the 9 per mole per second. Um, and we move on to, uh, uh, to uh, oxalate, oxalate reaction with adsorbed ozone, much more facile than the oxidation of formate. Uh, look, 10 to the 5 per mole per, mole per second compared to 40 for formate. Um, again, the oxidation by adsorbed hydroxyl radicals, very fast, um, and so on. And so, so we've been able to uh, deduce these rate constants from the, uh, the reactions I've just shown you. And uh, so we can now, uh, we now have a complete reaction set uh, for, uh, for the system. Well, it's our hypothesized reaction set. So what we've done is uh, hypothesized reaction set uh, we can now uh, we can now use um, um, uh, a software. Uh, we can we can uh, develop a, a kinetic model with these uh, a rate uh, rate um, these reactions. Uh, these uh, these uh, reaction sets can be modeled uh, by software. Now we use off the shelf software. Um, we use a package called Kintecus. Now this is uh, freeware on the web. I encourage you all to have a look at this. It's, it's used widely by uh, enzyme uh, uh, modelers and chemical engineers. Uh, so we can uh, we can set up these reaction sets in our in our um, in our software package, and we can model quantitatively uh, these reactions. So Kintecus is a as I said here a simulation program that enables prediction of the the concentration of reactants and products as a function of time uh, based on numerical integration of the, the rate equations that are appropriate to the hypothesized reactive mechanism. Now, if our, if our predicted uh, concentrations of reactants and products agrees with our observed concentrations of reactants and products as a function of time, we can conclude that the hypothesized reaction set, the mechanism we propose, is solid, it's good. If we, if we find departure between model, prediction, and experiment, we, we know there's something missing. We need, we need to go back and play with our, our mechanism. We need to look at, uh, look at what's missing and, uh, and, and look at uh, reactions that might account for any discrepancy between uh, our observed and predicted uh, sets of data. So that approach we've used widely in my group in the last 10 years. And it's, it's helped greatly to really, uh, really understand mechanism. So what I've done is I've taken here uh, uh, a system, catalytic ozonation has been used or studied very widely by many groups around the world. We've uh, obtained uh, data from a very well-defined system, uh, well-defined in the laboratory, and also well-defined in terms of uh, literature values of rate constants and knowledge about the mechanism. 
uh, we've then uh, we've then numerically modeled the process and compared with our experimental experimental results in order to try to pull apart and come to understand the basic phenomena that's going on here. Now, if you look back at our our uh, our, our sets of data, I won't go through it all, but you see here that uh, the model uh, shown as lines describe our data pretty well. Now. Uh, these are just the adsorption data. Th these lines show the, the model for the adsorption uh, of both formate and oxalate to our, our two catalysts. Here we, uh, let me go back, let me go back to our right at the start. Here um, uh, I show the model fits, again, the lines describing our, um, giving our, our predicted behavior of oxalate decay or CO2 formation. And you see that it's not perfect, but it's pretty good. Uh, we are doing quite well in describing uh, loss of our target species or formation of our oxidized product. Uh, our model does predict, our prediction does follow our data pretty well. Now, our models describing this whole set of data, it's not just one set. The model is a, is a global model that we're using to describe the whole set. And that's pretty impressive uh, we aren't we aren't cherry picking here one sort of data and fitting it. These are not fitted uh, fitted uh, results. These are a model that's based on a mechanism that's, that's describing uh, all of our data in the system, uh, and we think that's uh, a very useful uh, validation of our proposed mechanism. And uh, you can see in all cases uh, the model is pretty good in describing our, our results. So we are pleased. The model looks fairly complex, but in fact, it's, it's not too bad. Um, and it does describe our data pretty well. What's nice is we can also use a model to describe conditions that we haven't studied in the, in the, in the, in the laboratory. And so here I show some uses of the, of the, the model to describe some general phenomena about the, these systems. So in these plots, I, I show how much oxidation is occurring on the surface. And what you see is that for oxalate uh, on the left-hand side, uh, these plots on the left-hand side, and the top one shows the reactions on the LDH, uh, the bottom show reactions on the copper oxide, all, almost all the reactions occurring on the surface, 100%. So the red, the dark red here shows that almost all the reactions occurring on the surface, especially at the high catalyst doses, not surprising, but the, the, the model allows us to show that very nicely, very quantitatively, uh, in this case, for the oxalate, almost all the reactions are occurring on the surface. In comparison, the formate, uh, except at the very high catalyst doses, a lot happens uh, in solution. There's a lot of homogeneous oxidation by ozone occurring in solution. And the model describes that very nicely, especially for the copper oxide, as uh, shown in the bottom plot here. So the model allows us to describe the behavior over a wide range of conditions that we haven't studied in the, in the laboratory, but we've, uh, we can predict the behavior uh, using our, our model. Uh, this also, we can use the model also to, to tell whether the, the, the decay occurs via uh, a non-radical pathway, that is either by homogeneous, homogeneous ozonation or ozonation on the surface. And so in the case of, of oxalate, shown on the left-hand side, uh, almost all the reactions occurring by reaction of adsorbed ozone, uh, that's what's decaying the adsorbed oxalate. Uh, whereas on the left-hand side, we see that a lot of reactions occurring by, uh, by a, a non-radical process. Um, uh, well, there's, there's, sorry, there's much less occurring by a non-radical process. A lot of the, uh, a lot of the format uh, degradation occurs by reaction of a radical, hydroxyl radical, uh, it, uh, well, at, at the surface uh, or in solution. So in, in this case, we've seen that a lot, of the, a lot of the decay is occurring either on the surface by hydroxyl radicals or in solution by, by homogeneous ozonation. So the model allows us to, uh, to really differentiate, pull apart the system and to describe what's, what's going on um, under conditions that we haven't uh, examined uh, um, experimentally. So in summary, uh, let me let me just wrap up. Uh, so uh, so uh, copper-based catalysts uh, are pretty efficient catalysts for heterogeneous catalytic ozonation, especially for ozone-resistant compounds like oxalate. 
and the, the catalytic uh, activity, activity of uh, the LDH catalyst is um, occurs for the most part by the, the layered structure, which provides high adsorption of both the organic and, and of ozone. In fact, it seems to stabilize ozone uh, on the surface. Uh, it, it doesn't transform ozone rapidly to hydroxyl radical because hydroxyl radical would be, rap uh, would be rapidly, rap rapidly consumed by the, by the catalyst. And so uh, in addition to, um, to induction of uh, a, a radical mediated uh, a, a pathway, um, uh, uh, this, this pathway of stabilization of ozone uh, is a nice alternative. So many catalysts are chosen in order to enhance generation of hydroxyl radicals. We've shown here that that's not critical, that adsorption of ozone alone by catalysts like LDH can be very efficient and we can minimize the futile loss of the oxidant by, 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 this, by this process. So we show that we, we don't need to transform to a radical. We can oxidize very readily by adsorbed ozone. So catalysts with high surface adsorption, efficiency, both ozone and target organic, uh, do facilitate performance of the uh, uh, heter heterogeneous catalytic ozonization process. Um, while the, uh, while the LDH catalyst uh, results in removal of formate, the enhancement of ozone use efficiency isn't as significant as, as that of oxalate because a formate's readily oxidized by ozone in solution. It's pretty obvious. Uh, you don't need the catalyst as much for, uh, for formate. Uh, so for compounds that are readily oxidized by ozone, uh, you don't need a catalyst. You can use a homogeneous process. Uh, whereas uh, the catalytic process is required for oxidation of compounds like, like oxalate that really are, are, are quite refractory to the direct ozonation process. Um, so, uh, so it's clear that in general, a multi-stage process would be optimal where you have a, a mixed suite of organic compounds. And that's quite common if you're dealing with, uh, I don't know, food waste or uh, waste from a, 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 a membrane process. Uh, some compounds will be, will be degraded by uh, ozone in, in solution. Others will need a catalyst. So a, a, a dual process where you have a, an, an initial degradation of the, uh, of the easily degraded uh, uh, compounds by ozone in solution, that should proceed then a, a process uh, where you pass the, the compound into a reactor where you have a catalyst that readily absorbs both ozone uh, and the organic. Uh, ideally doesn't degrade or transform ozone to hydroxyl radicals, uh, but the adsorbed ozone in that case can act efficiently uh, to degrade the adsorbed organic. And uh, so uh, through, through this rather simple set of studies in the laboratory, we've shown how we might uh, optimize a process uh, for degrading uh, a, mixed, uh, a mixed wastewater containing uh, organics. So, that's really all I wanted to uh, talk about tonight, showing that we can, we can use this process of kinetic modeling to both understand the process and then take that model to optimize the process uh, uh, under conditions that we haven't studied in the laboratory. So thank you very much. Um, a fairly simple study, but I think the approach we've taken, uh, there are a few lessons there uh, to be learned for, for everyone. So thank you very much. Thank you, Professor David White, for uh, enlightening us regarding the oxidation of oxalate and formate using catalytic oxidation. And because uh, oxidation of these compounds is quite difficult by other AOPs because heavy metals, what we are using, it will make a complex with oxalate and formate. So the oxidation of these compounds is quite difficult. But you revealed that this can be uh, degraded by catalytic oxidation. So now we will go for panel discussion. Uh, Professor S.K. Majidar, please uh, discuss about this. Can you hear me, please? Yeah, yeah, yes. yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, Professor uh, Wait, uh, a very nice lecture. Uh, yeah, you have been, uh, I think, uh, uh, given this uh, explanation of uh, uh, catalytic ozonation for uh, oxalate and uh, formate. Uh, yeah, there are nice results uh, that I can see, but uh, only thing is that uh, 
how can we apply suppose in a process for the treatment of waste water if we are having suppose uh, if we are having such uh, the mixer of suppose oxalate and uh, formate both another uh, point is that uh, uh, i think uh, I, i want to know uh, uh, what is the effect of temperature is there any temperature effect on that reaction or not Uh, so let me let me tackle the first question first. So we've chosen we've chosen formate and oxalate as two simple, uh, simple but quite different compounds. Now in a real wastewater, you'll very very rarely have just formate and oxalate. You'll have a, a whole mix of, of really complicated organics. But what I've shown you is that um, what I'm trying to say is that in that wastewater, some compounds will be degraded like formate by homogeneous ozonation. Okay. Other compounds. Won't they'll need it? They'll need a catalytic process, and so what I'm what I'm saying is that for complex wastewater, use use a, a dual process where you optimize a homogeneous process to degrade those compounds that are degraded homogeneously, and then use a catalytic process for compounds that are degraded or need a catalyst to to, to drive degradation. So, um, so really, the lesson is that. A wastewater. What I suggest people should do is take a wastewater and do some simple studies to categorise what can be degraded homogeneously and what can't, and then and then design or develop your your process with that knowledge. Okay. Um, okay. So that's uh, the answer to the first point. Uh, yeah. Another <laughs> point. Okay. Fine. I got it. Uh, yeah. Another yeah. point is that what is the what is the ozone rate that you have followed? What is the ozone ozonation rate? So these are bat studies. Now we've uh, so we, okay. yeah, these are, these are bat studies. Bat we are doing work. We are doing work now in a, in a flowing system where where the ozone. Um, so we we maintain a constant concentration of ozone in these studies. Okay, so it is not a continuous. Anyway, it can be done in continuous mode also. Oh, right? indeed, that's that's yeah. right. Yes. Fine. Yes. In that case, you have actually mentioned about that homogeneous actually uh, reaction. All right, yeah. homogeneous. Then for that, I think uh, the distribution of the ozone it should be homogeneous throughout the reactor, am I right? Whether it is surface based or not surface based, whether it is catalyst or non-catalyst, yep. so yes. ozone should be distributed properly, am I right? Now you cannot directly you cannot directly add that ozone in a certain location, so it should be distributed. Either it can be distributed by you know uh, just uh, just by spudger or any distributor, yep. ozone distributor. Yep. in a yeah. continuous even uh, in a bas mode also yes fine another point is that uh, uh, now if so can i can i comment on that can i comment yeah yeah, yeah. so i i think what you're raising is the the homogeneity of the ozone and really the 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 fluid dynamics here are very important yeah that is that we, is important yeah we we need, we need to really understand the fluid dynamics in the system so i will say that there's a need to really yes, couple that, that that point actually i wanted to mention yeah okay so <laughs> in, in fact In fact, we are now beginning to couple C using CFD tools. We're using Fluent to describe the hydrodynamics, and we're yeah. coupling the hydrodynamic models with our chemistry in yeah. order to describe the process. Because uh, the, the concentration is critical to all these reactions. Now, I mean, another question uh, is that yeah, yeah. Well, another question is that that very nice uh, that you have done uh, in bas mode. Now, is it the fluidized mode or not? Is it fluidized mode or pad mode? that catalyst that you have used yeah yeah the catalyst that you have used yeah okay whether it is in fluidized mode or in a pack bed mode uh, so it's it's a, a suspension so in our in these suspension. studies okay. we have a, a fluidized suspension fluidized yeah. fluidized so it's a fluidized it's a fluidized fluidized, fluidized. 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 Correct. that is why Correct. you can get i think more mixing around the uh, mixing inside the reactor and yep. homogenization will be there but That's sometimes right. you know that back mixing may sometimes you know hinder that reaction and maybe you know a uh, distribution maybe you know uh, sometimes a uh, uh, mal distribution of flow will be there so uh, also, in that case it, it, yeah yeah it's also expensive case, to mix it's also yeah. expensive to fluidize so you may yeah, yeah. you may not want to fluidize <laughs> okay you you are not getting fluidized you may not want to fluidize so in our case it's fluidized but you may not want it because it's expensive the fluidize yeah. a bed takes a lot of energy you may not yeah, want to fluidize fine. that is fine but to gain something you have to anyway expense something no that is required 
okay the fluidized beds nowadays you know that fluidized bed to do the reaction in the fluidized bed also it is important because to get the homogenization of the uh, uh, ozonation reaction by distributing that ozone gas throughout the reactors all right nice so in this case uh, uh, anyway that fluidization reaction that will be important another thing is that you have not mentioned whether at what temperature is it in normal temperature or in some certain yeah, this, temperature this is, yeah. this is done at 23 plus one's one degree so it's lab temperature so these are about about uh, about room temperature temperature does speed up the process so if you go if you work at high temperatures you'll see most of these reactions speed up so yeah. temperature does have an effect in all the reactions okay very yeah. nice so uh, nice otherwise very nice uh, uh, work is there uh, uh, nice. Uh, I, I guess the new part, the modeling part. You know, I mean, a lot of you have done work like this, and others have. What's new here is saying, okay, we can now model this kinetically and use the model to 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 gain confidence that we understand the process, and then mm -hmm. use the model to optimize uh, the, yeah. the the process. Yeah, that is true. That is optimization based on flow rate, based on catalytic, uh, you know, catalyst load, based on temperature, based on other, you know. What is the uh, pH of that solution? That is also important. Uh, uh, I think you know that some kinetics that how it will be uh, actually uh, based on that uh, ozone rate also it is important because Correct. you know that that uh, 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 mass transfer, whatever yeah. mass transfer, reactive mass transfer, yeah. of course yeah. it will be happened here. Yeah. So in that case, that ozonation rate is very important because we are doing also in continuous mode. Okay, that in ozonation process for the pharmaceuticals products. You'll see some uh, publications also are probably heat and mass transfer there on publication. Even uh, environmental chemical engineering, there are publication there. You'll see some, uh, you know, uh, good uh, you know, ozonation process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Process. Uh, you and should send me that, your publications. You should send me your publications. I'd like to read them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we okay. need to learn from each other. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, sure. Uh, I want to get your email address so that I can communicate you uh, based on this, you know. Sure, that, that'd uh, be great. Right. Uh, process and uh, fine i think uh, yeah uh, i can uh, you know say that it is a nice work ah very nice uh, and i am uh, you know uh, privileged that to get contact with you like this with this uh, you know contact yeah so, that's very nice to meet you so, yeah. so in future we'll, 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 we'll actually we'll be in uh, keep in touch uh, regarding this okay okay, okay. sounds sure. great uh, uh, sure Thank, thank you, you, thank you, thank you, Doctor uh, Professor Majuntar. Uh, Doctor Madheshwar, please. Uh, yeah, yeah. Have any discussions? Uh, professor, nice presentation. Uh, as of uh, in, from your discussion, what I understand is uh, you are mostly concentrating on only surface uh, adsorption. Uh, based on the adsorption, the, what is the kinetics? What is the reaction is going on? Uh, what I want to know is uh, 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 what is the bulk reactions? How you consider the bulk ki bulk uh, kinetics? Uh, so we we understand the bulk homogeneous kinetics quite well. So we the the the, the, the homogeneous ozonation processes are well understood in these cases. These compounds, formate and oxide, are very simple compounds, and the bulk homogeneous chemistry, the reaction with ozone. Are very well understood, and so we, we can model those very nicely. Uh, but if you are developed that model, that model has to be considered both uh, direct uh, direct oxidation and indirect oxidation. So okay. if you are going for indirect oxidation, there uh, surface surface adsorption and desorption you have to consider. So in this uh, whatever that model you consider this uh, mass transfer coefficients and uh, desorption coefficient adsorption coefficients are considered. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so the second table shows all the surface reactions. So it shows the absorption of ozone, the absorption of the organics, the reactions on the surface. So if you look at that second table, they are all the surface reactions. So the model I've shown you show has both the homogeneous part and the heterogeneous part. They're all there. Yeah. What is the reason? As uh, I understand that uh, one catalyst you consider as a hydroxyl catalyst, hydroxide layer and another catalyst is oxide layer uh, is there is any difference of uh, kinetics which we observe you observe that uh, in the ozonation as uh, you consider the copper oxide and another one is a double layer hydroxide uh, this itself has a different properties 
so you obviously you have to observe that there must be a different kinetics uh, yep very different so if you look at the right the right constants are very different so go back to the table two you'll see that the, the if you compare copper oxide and the copper aluminium the h the rate constants are very different and the, they, they behave very differently. The LDH has very high surface area, so it absorbs much more of the ozone and the organic. The copper oxide doesn't absorb as much, and the ozone that absorbs on the copper oxide is transformed to hydroxyl radicals very readily. Whereas on the LDH, that doesn't happen. The ozone absorbs, but doesn't transform to, to hydroxyl radical. So quite different behavior for those two catalysts. So uh, I, I am working on the preparation of hydroxyl, uh, double layer hydroxides. Yep. As I prepared the different uh, compositions of nickel, aluminum, al uh, copper, aluminum, as uh, the application of uh, supercapacitors. But uh, I did, uh, never I tried to ozonation process. Uh, as you were, from the, your presentation itself, I understand that this can be has uh, one of the uh, the catalyst can use for this. Uh, yeah. I can try to use this uh, for a uh, studying of ozonation. Yeah, it seems that the LDH is a, a wonderful catalyst because they absorb the ozone, but don't they don't degrade the ozone. They they simply absorb it and form a more reactive species on the surface. And that's the, that's a critical factor here. The absorbed ozone is much more reactive than the dissolved ozone. And in addition, the ozone that's absorbed on the LDH doesn't decay to hydroxyl radical, but it's still very powerful as an oxidant. There is any uh, non-reactive products that has to be influence your kinetics? Uh, so the copper oxide, so the copper oxide forms um, a lot of non-reactive products. So the, the ozone hydroxyl radicals react with the copper oxide and, and produce non-reactive products. You, you waste your oxidant. Um, in terms of the organics, in this case, there are no intermediates. So that's why it's a nice, a nice case because both oxalate and formate don't form intermediates. They just go to CO2. So the, the case I've given you is, is a very uh, simple case where there are no, there are no organics that are, that are non-reactive. In a real wastewater, you might have some very refractory organics that simply sit on the surface and don't degrade. And that's a problem. Uh, okay. As uh, you develop any system, uh, as a, other than the catalyst, you develop any good system for a, a catalytic ozonation as a system. Uh, we think uh, that this and uh, industrial system level, industrial scale level, industrial uh, scale level, any system you develop for uh, the process. Uh, we we think that this this LDH is probably the best we found. We've, we've, we've studied quite a few catalysts. As I said, we've been working with Chinese companies and every different company has their own catalyst. So we've been studying quite a few, you know, activated carbon with absorbed iron oxides, uh, many different catalysts. But, but in our view, the, the LDHs are, 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 very, are very good catalysts it, it, uh, because they do absorb strongly, but don't degrade the, uh, the oxidant. Thank you, Professor. Thank okay, you for the meeting. Thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Dr. Gugge, please. Uh, excellent presentation, uh, Professor David, uh, with the mention of software package kinetics. Uh, I have some doubts. Uh, the first one is what about the cost of. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, the first one is what is the what about the cost of catalytic ozonation? When we go for ozonation, generally they talk about the cost generation of ozone cost. So how can we tackle that uh, cost part? You know, um, any advanced oxidation process is expensive. Uh, um, the, the cheapest is probably Fenton. Uh, the problem with Fenton is that it only works at low pH and produces a lot of waste product. And so it's a cheap process till you have to, have to manage the waste and then it gets expensive. Um, uh, you look at other technologies using using UV light. It's too expensive. It just, it's completely impractical. Um, there's been a lot of work on these uh, light catalyzed processes, but no one uses them. They're too expensive. But ozonation is finding a niche in the market because it's not that expensive. So um, 
that's why we are seeing uh, we're seeing ozone nation being used now in wastewater because it's not it's not as expensive as the, the other AOP technologies. Um, producing the ozone is still one of the difficult, uh, the more expensive parts of the technology, but compared to the other the other possibilities, it's the best cost option, and that's why we are seeing it beginning to really be used very widely in industry. And uh... When we treat uh, real wastewater, what's the impact of salts, salts present in that wastewater? Sometimes those salts act as radical scavengers, then uh, minimizing our ozone effect. So yeah. How to yeah. tackle that salt part of the wastewater? Yeah, it, it is an issue. So, um, you know, often these wastewaters are high in salt and high organics. Yeah, often especially textile wastewater. But they often contain both. And so you need to both get rid of uh, salt and, and organics. Um, we haven't studied the effect of salt much. Uh, the studies we did, we have a lot of carbonate there and carbonate, carbonate's a good hydroxyl radical scavenger. Um, uh, so it has an effect, if, if you're relying on hydroxyl radicals, the carbonate can diminish the effect of hydroxyl radicals. But it, in, the, in the case I've just shown you, hydroxyl radical generation is not the primary oxidant. The primary oxidant here is adsorbed ozone and the salt doesn't seem to have a huge effect on the adsorbed ozone reactivity. Whereas salt, chloride, carbonate does have a big effect on hydroxyl radical reactivity. And so if you're relying on say an iron oxide catalyst where the major oxidant seems to be hydroxyl radical, salt may have a big effect. In the case I've shown you where the adsorbed ozone seems to be the active oxidant, salt's not so effective. What about the chair? change of pH during the ozonation process? Have you considered while, uh, while setting that ozonation because ozonation is a very pH sensitive process? So yeah, it is. So in these studies, we, we had quite a strong buffer. We had a carbonate buffer. Uh, we have two millimolar carbonate. So it's, you know, it's quite high and quite a lot of CO2. And that's quite a good buffer. It's quite a good natural buffer. And the pH changed by around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 units. It wasn't very much, a small, smallish pH change. We've only done work so far at one pH, around 7.3, you know, 7.3 plus minus 0.2. The pH will have quite a big effect on the process. Uh, we have not studied yet in our group uh, effects of pH in any great detail. Even we have to consider point of zero charge of catalyst also. Point of zero charge of catalyst, that will also have the impact on our ozonation efficiency. It, it, it will. Uh, in both these cases, the, the point of zero charge is about 7, 7.5. Okay. Uh, but it, it will have an effect. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thanks. Thanks for your presentation. I will save okay. your presentation and I will get details from uh, Dr. Nidish. Thank you, Santos. Thank thanks, you. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Google. So I, uh, I like, I, I invite Dr. M. Suresh Kumar, scientist and head EAS division for uh, proposing what of thanks. Hello. There may be some error in network. No, it's some error in the network. I think he's mute. Yeah. Yeah, it's on mode. Sorry, it's on mode. Sir, please. Yes, you are calling me. Ah, sir, uh, Suresh Kumar, sir, please propose the water of thanks. Yes. Ah, yes, 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 sir. Please proceed for what of thanks. Hello. Okay. Uh, distinguished Professor David and panel members and participants. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. Proceed, proceed. Yeah. There is some error. It 
it's not actually why is it not going now it's okay uh yeah yeah now it's okay fine Suresh Kumar sir please now it's clear okay 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 a distinguished professor david panel members participants on behalf of csr neeli i am very delighted to propose the vote of thanks to those who have directly or indirectly contributed to this webinar on mechanistic insights into the catalytic ozone catalytic ozonation process the kinetic model approach organized by our institute at the outset i thank our chief guest and resource person professor david bai to take out valuable time to take out a valuable time for this busy schedule and he has given a wonderful lecture in explaining about the basics of the heterogeneous catalytic ozonation that is influence on ozonation mechanism and the role of hydroxyl radicals on oxidation process and catalyst organic interactions really we are thankful to you sir for your vast experience the sharing your vast experience on this subject we are really enlightened with your knowledge and the way of explanation about catalytic oxidation i acknowledge the panel members professor s k mujumdar dr mateshwaran and my colleague dr s p guge for making it a vibrant discussion i would like to express our deep gratitude to our honorable director csr neeri for his, his enthusiastic support and encouragement our heartfelt thanks to the participants from all over the world for their enthusiastic participation i thank you one and all thank you very much thank you thank you thank you, uh, thank you dr suresh kumar thank you so uh, today's discussion is almost over for the viewers uh please check the brochures tomorrow we will meet again on with uh, the talk of professor peter from uh, us he is from vegna tech and he will talk about the application of nanotechnology in water and wastewater treatment and those who are not registered in the program please log, uh, register today itself and today night we will uh, close the registration process and on behalf of neeri and one and one person i would i would my express, express my gratitude to professor david wait and panel members professor sk majumdar madeshan sir and buge for joining with me thank you thank you thank Absolutely. you very much thank, thank you. you and good good night a uh, good night good yeah bye bye bye, bye.